right, welcome everybody. I don't know about you, but uh, in the uh, last session, I was concerned about falling asleep. Right after lunchtime, I know I personally got about three hours sleep. I got in at about 2.30 a.m. into my hotel last night. That was, that was rough. But I was riveted to every single thing that he talked about. And as a speaker, you always want to go after somebody who's boring. And that was not boring. So I will try not to, not to disappoint. So um, we're going to go on a journey today. So let's, let's, let's begin. I, I always think it's important, uh, since I don't know most of you, to at least uh, th that you know three things about me, just to somewhat connect, since we don't have a chance to, to meet personally. Uh, I uh, have five kids. <laughs> and the last time I showed this slide at a conference, someone said, are you going to start doing people analytics on your family? Like real, real, f real funny joker, real funny, real funny. Um, and uh, we live in Edinburgh, Scotland. This picture is taken on the sunniest day of the year in Scotland. <laughs> and the third thing is that we love to go on journeys around Scotland. We have a van, as you can imagine, it's a big van, and we go all over Scotland on the weekends. And I kind of think of that like people analytics. We're all on this journey together. And some of us are new in the journey. Some of us uh, have been on the journey for a while now. But guess what? That's OK. Or any, you know, many of you might be at this conference thinking, wow, so many companies are doing some really advanced things, and I'm not. That's okay, don't worry. We're, we're all on a journey together. We're gonna take it step by step. Hopefully, this presentation will uh, have a couple of things that apply to the people who are new in the journey and people who are more advanced in the journey. My objective is that at some point during this conversation that we have together, you do this in emoji fashion. You just kinda go, hmm, that was interesting. That's something that I'm gonna think about on my way home tonight or tomorrow morning on the way into the office. That was interesting. That's all I want. And I promise you that on some level, do not be surprised that you will disagree with something that I say. Sometimes when we go to these conferences, we think we all have to say the, the, the correct things that are just not confrontational, not abrasive at all. I might not do that, okay? And even if you disagree, guess what? That's totally okay. The other item is this. You're going to see I'm smiley, I'm really passionate, but I also get really frustrated because there's things that happen in this market that I think we need to be doing a better job of, and I'm going to call those out. So note that I'm smiley, I'm passionate, but I've also got a little vinegar in me as well, but don't take it personally. So let's get going. How can your people analytics strategy improve? You have one currently. It could be that you are a sole operator, and it's four levels between you and the CHRO. It could be that you report directly to the CHRO, you have a large team. You, regardless, have some type of strategy, and every single one of us can improve that strategy in some form or fashion. I'm going to present today four areas for you to think about. For you to think about. Area number one. Focus on achieving the executive's targets. So let's talk about Dave Ulrich. Most of us have all heard about Dave Ulrich. He's, uh, you know, you might call him the, the grandfather or the father of modern HR. And on his tombstone, may he live long in time, but eventually when he goes, on his tombstone, there will be one phrase. And it will be this, because he's the one who coined it and he's the one who talks about it. Every single time you've ever seen Dave Ulrich talk, he says this. HR isn't about HR. HR is about the business itself. So let's think about this. When we walk and we come into an organization, we usually show a slide and to do a little bit of an exercise. And we say, can you help us understand what your company's targets are regarding these three items? Tell us about what your revenue goals are. Tell us about what your profits are. Tell us about your customers. So the ones who are driving. Something along those ones. The third one sometimes changes depending upon the industry, but you kind of get the point. And if that people analytics function cannot tell us what those are clearly, then we have a, we have a disconnect. Because let's think about it for a minute. 
we're talking about analytics on the most important asset that you have, right? How many times have we heard CEOs talk about people are our most important asset? They invest billions of dollars into supply chain, into finance functions, into certain things to support the business. Yet, how much are they investing as it relates to systems to really understand the business, or people analytics function, true insights? And there needs to be a strong connection between what we're working on and what the executives are trying to work on as well. And oftentimes, we find that there is a disconnect. There is a, a great company. Uh, many of you may have heard about it. There, it's uh, um, Andreessen Horowitz, which is a very famous company, a very, very famous uh, venture capital company in the Bay Area. Um, many of people know Andreessen or Horowitz. They're the two founding partners, uh, great thought leaders. Ben Horowitz has a thing called Ben's Blog. It's, it's f f fabulous to read. Yet, they recognize that when we are talking about strategy, and we're talking about systems, and we're talking about functions, they realize that there is this disconnect between those two functions. So they came up with their four levels of connectivity. And this is designed for, and, and, and I could easily change it for the HR side, but I want to kind of preserve it because this is, their, this is their picture. I'm going to show it here. This is their way of tying critical capabilities, or what you might call projects up to what the executives care about. Because in their sample example here, the CFO is responsible for delivering earnings growth of 15% to the organization. So how do we tie, how do we tie this project down here at the bottom of reallocating systems or rolling back certain applications within the business? How do we tie that to justify our project to the CFO? Well, they go through, they go from critical capabilities up to key initiatives, in this case, a labor virtualization and offshoring. Well, why would we do that? Well, we do that because they're going to consolidate distribution operations into six global regional centers. And then why would they do that? Well, because that's how we're going to get earnings growth of 15%. So we can see this bottom-up, top-down approach to justifying what it is that we're trying to do. And if you work your way back down, well, the executives got together and said, let's we got to grow earnings by 15%. How are we going to do that? Well, we got to consolidate this distribution and operations. Let's do it into six global channels. And then the business can take it from there. What a great linkage, right? If you go in and you say, OK, we need to justify this project. And here is how we tie to your business objectives. I think you're going to get your project approved. And that is one of the biggest derailers we find when people try to get their projects approved, is that there is not a, con there is not a sufficient, con sufficient connection. Let me offer, if you're looking for a way to practice, here is a way to practice. Let's take a book out of the Twitter uh, playbook here. Twitter allows you, what, 140 characters. Can you, in a tweet, justify your investment to your executive audience. Mr. and Mrs. Executive, this project will fill in the blank. What you'll generally find is that you can't keep it to 140. You can't keep it to 280. You might even challenge getting it down to 1,000 because your message is not crystallized. Compare that to this. That person can crystallize that value proposition in 140 characters because they understand this. It's a great exercise. Can you get that to me in a valuable tweet? Yes or no? Practice it. Second item. Second item. Uh, it, it, and I say this with all love and candor so many times, and this is understandable because we get, all of us have a job to do. We're employed, and it can be so easy for us to get so focused on the minutia and the details that a lot of times, and that's what's great about conferences like these, they help us come up a little bit, stick our head above the clouds, and get a better perspective and a better vision of the world. Well, I would invite you to expand your vision about your people analytics strategy by playing two games. I'll explain the games in just a minute. But let me lead up to the games um, by 
uh, giving you another quote. And this is from another great visionary out there in the world. Who's this? Do we know? It is the Salesforce guy. That's Mark Benioff, founder and CEO of Salesforce.com. If you think about it, talk about a guy who revolutionized an entire industry. And uh, anybody ever been to Dreamforce, their annual conference at all in San Francisco, where they bring in 250,000 people into San Francisco? They shut down all the main boulevards. It's absolutely nuts. Uh, I've had the privilege of going three times. Heard him speak, and he always shares some version of this story every single year in his keynote. And I think it's really important. He talks about how he visits with, uh, you know, with people, his clients around the globe. And he says, I'll so often be sitting down there face to face with them. And they're talking about functionality of this and functionality of this. And he's just like, you don't need a new version of the software. You need a new vision. You need to come up with where you're actually going because you're so focused on the in, in, on, on the minutiae, on the details, that you need to be thinking about what your vision and where you actually want to be heading. And he talks about that frequently. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a game. Again, since uh, I've got five kids, I've played plenty of this game. Let me ask this question. <clears throat> what game is this? Connect the dots, right? What animal are we drawing? Anybody know? Anybody know what animal we're drawing? Anybody know? Well, I'll help you out. I'll help you out. Oh, we're drawing a fish. Right? Pretty easy, right? All right. So let me talk about game number one. Game number one is connecting the dots. Connecting the dots. Think about this from a people analytics perspective. There are dots of data all over your organization. Let me show you a couple of the dots. Remember I showed you four dots? Let me show you a couple of dots. Here's a couple of dots. You got your core HR system, and you got your payroll system. Okay? Can we start to connect some dots? Absolutely. How much insight are we really going to generate by connecting the dots, and we limit our vision, if we just limit our vision, to that? What kind of dots, or what kind of animals could we draw if we connected a lot more dots. So many of us have information across the entire ecosystem, and a lot of times we're not thinking about it because we're just thinking about these one or two systems and what is it that we can do from here, when we might be able to say, hey, look, we've got an engagement platform. We've got onboarding information. Wow! You know what? Have we ever thought about how we could tie information from our applicant tracking system through onboarding and into our performance system, so that way we can answer the age-old question of what makes a great hire. Now, I know what I described sounds pretty easy, and in reality, it's not. But so often, again, when we come and talk to organizations, they are limited to that. Oh, and by the way, what did I just cover? I just covered core HR systems. I didn't cover other types of data that we can link into the, into the ecosystem, such as sales data, financial information, operations, supply chain, not to mention safety, particularly for those who are involved in a manufacturing setting, or also customer information. Is it possible to bring that information together to provide, true, you know, to provide a deeper sense of people analytics? Absolutely. So uh, one of the games that I'd invite you to play when your teams, when you go back, is play a game of connect the dots. Identify what are the different data sources where we can have information, and then identify what type of connections you can make. Now, that's a help, helpful exercise, but always remember, just connecting data sources doesn't mean it's going to be valuable for the business. You can do some cool stuff. You can do lots of cool stuff, but it doesn't mean it's going to drive business. But it is a helpful exercise to get people to be thinking uh, about what type of connections we can make. I always think about, I don't know if you remember this, famous, uh, the famous uh, A Beautiful Mind, uh, where he makes all of these connections. And you can see how his brain was working at a different level. Well, great. Try that out. See how it works. Here's game number two. This is uh, a game that, uh, that a company uses. 
and it's been very successful for them. And I thought I'd share it here. And this is actually where that they uh, will hire, uh, they will do interview processes, particularly for internal candidates when they're looking at making them involved in the people analytics function. I thought this would be interesting to share. What they do is they play uh, a game. They get a whiteboard. And they say, they write on the whiteboard at the bottom, operational. And at the top, they'll write more strategic. And they'll put at the bottom a variety of boxes of very tactical operational processes, which I'll show you in just a minute. And they say, how can you take that box and think about it differently to make it more strategic? And they just let them answer the question. Okay, so we'll, that's step one. I'll show you what I mean. They'll write things at the bottom, such as track applicants, administer comp and manage payroll, review headcount, capture performance reviews, process entries and exits, and ask, how can you make that more strategic? Well, let's test them, right? Isn't this a great test? Because hopefully they say, well, you know what? Instead of just tracking applicants, could we find a way to where we could actually try and hire more top talent faster for the organization? Ah. All right, instead of just reviewing, uh, instead of just uh, processing entries and exits, Jeez, is there a way that we can identify and retain flight risks for the organization? Wouldn't that be more valuable than just processing entries and exits? Ah, oh, see, so we're moving from transactional to more strategic for the organization. And then guess what they'll do? They'll wipe off the bottom and say, so let's see if we can go to another level and really get them thinking. This is a fabulous exercise to do, again, as a team function. If you do a, a lunch and learn on a Friday and take some of those critical boxes that you're doing and identify how can we make this more and more strategic over time. <clears throat> In the sake of time, I'm going to move on to number three. Dashboards are not the destination. Dashboards are great. Don't get me wrong. Here is the common scenario. This is one of those ones where when I'm in a meeting and I'm visiting with somebody for the first time and, and they start telling me about their process and I start hearing something, I start grabbing the table and I, and I get sweaty and I'm like, oh! Where you're like, hey, we've done this two-year project. It's awesome. We now have five dashboards rolled out to the entity. Five dashboards. You laugh! But it's true, maybe some of you are here, maybe it's in, sh in shame. And by the way, congratulations, because that's part of your journey. That's part of your journey. But do not assume that that is the end of the journey because you're able to throw out these, these great dashboards. I always, always like this little Willy Wonka, you know, you've probably seen this meme on the internet. Uh, oh, you really think your dashboard is business insight? Right? It's a step in the journey, let's, let's recognize that. I've got a great quote. This is probably my favorite quote of the whole time. This is from Jonathan Boudreau. Many of you might read his stuff. Awesome uh, author, PhD out of USC. Here's what he says. I know it's a long one, but hang with me here. A common trap with metrics is believing that their mere existence is strategic. I've got dashboards. Sure, the ability to track things like revenue per employee or time until promotion is enticing. But it's not strategic if these numbers aren't applied in ways that improve strategic value. Often, executives are satisfied with simply having HR analytics platforms, wrongly believing the numbers themselves were the strategy. The deliverable, the principle that he's trying to teach here is that the deliverable of dashboards or metrics themselves is not the strategy. And that's an important mind shift that a lot of times we have to make so that we don't celebrate the fact that we're creating dashboards. So let's do in our own self-assessment, shall we? Anybody recognize this? Yeah, you see a lot of heads going up and down. You've probably seen it before. This is Burson's, Josh Burson's four levels. We've seen it before, but I always think it's helpful to review because this is kind of more of a self-analysis here. So. He says that he's got four different levels as it relates to this people analytics journey that we're all on. One is the operational reporting function. This means that you have reactive reporting, 
You're doing some compliance measures, and you're focusing on data accuracy. Let me convert that into the way that I hear it. In the, in the, oh yeah, we get questions, and then we go and we research them for a while, and we have some of these candid reports that we do for compliance purposes to get them out to the organization. And uh, we're really working on the data, data accuracy right now. All right, okay, good, good first journey, but that's not the end. Advanced, look what he says still. It's still reporting. Proactive reporting for decision makers. We're pushing stuff out to people. Okay, we're pushing. You're pushing. You're starting to get there. We're doing some analysis. We've got some, some high level benchmarks that we're understanding. Good job. And some self service components. People can come in and get this. Right? That's great. Again, a lot of times people view that self service is the end journey. It's, it's, it's part of the process. Advanced analytics, right? Now we're actually starting to solve the business problems, being able to create insights that create that help us with actionable solutions on what to do. Then we get to predictive, which is now forecasting what's going to happen in the future, as well as understanding really true workforce planning. And then here is the self-incriminating part for all of us. Should be the gut punch. 56% in operational reporting, 30% in advanced reporting, meaning that 86% of us are still in the reporting function, according to, to the way he does it. 10% in advanced analytics, and four really getting predictive and doing that predictive uh, workforce planning. That's a pretty, sorry, uh, critical self-assessment of the industry itself. Again, do we want to look at this as we're bad people? No, it just shows us that we're part of this journey, and we need to keep moving forward, and we need to keep elevating our vision and to move beyond just dashboards. Fourth item, iterative, I know this is kind of a mouthful, I'll explain it. Iterative results on current data. Can I just, just like that frustration that I hear before about dashboards being the journey, here's the second biggest frustration that I hear. Is they say, oh, we could never do this. Oh, we've just got so many data problems. Oh, just our data is just not, just not good enough, and we're going to have to spend two years to get our data all cleansed. We're going to do a two-year data project, and then we'll be ready to start doing it. No! Stop it! Don't fall into that trap, because guess what you're doing? You're doing the waterfall method. Waterfall is the old-school way of doing software development where you figure out your requirements, you do an analysis, you do a design function, you do all the coding, you do the testing and acceptance, and then that's three years, three plus years. And you're not iterating. You're just doing this long, giant project without minimal results. Hence why, anybody recognize what these are? Ad this is the Agile Manifesto. And I'm not going to bore you with it, but this is why a, a group of very forward-thinking software developers got together and said, we need to change this thing. This waterfall thing ain't working. We need to determine that our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of value software. Early and continuous. Not all at once. Continuous. I mean, get something out. Third thing, deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a, per, with a preference to the shorter time scale. What are they saying? Get stuff out. Do not wait two years on these long things. If you structure it right, you get the right organization in place, you're going to be able to pump out information to the organization. It's not going to be all. Maybe it's just a dashboard to begin with, but you can iterate. So. If you, I promise you, if you subscribe to the we're going to wait until our data is clean model, the way of thinking, I promise you this is you. I promise you. You're going to be waiting at that train station for that clean train to arrive, and it's never going to come. Because clean data is almost an oxymoron when you're dealing with billions and billions of bits of data, which many of, our, many of these companies have. I believe, this might be where we would disagree, but I believe that a great way to actually clean your data is to use it. It's to exercise it. It's to show that it's inaccurate in a report, so that way it highlights it. I believe that sunshine is the best disinfectant, or the best cleaner. Get it under a microscope. Put it through something, so that way you're able to see the data itself in live form. 
Okay, I'm about uh, out of time, so just maybe a last couple of thoughts. I feel like many of us are so close. It's just right there. But sometimes we just need somebody to tell us that we might be a little bit too focused on the minutia when it's sitting right there. We can just put a couple things together and get something out. I also think that the impact that we can have on the organization is huge. I love people analytics stories. When people say, I've got a people analytics story in our organization, you just all of a sudden I'm like this, oh, please tell me more. I want to hear more. And I'm not going to bore you with these ones. I already talked to the one a bit about this this morning, so I'm not going to talk about that one, how the company is able to deliver back to the CFO on a silver platter 90 million euro of budget that they're able to reinvest because of a better workforce planning process. And an, another organization um, that uh, I, I listened to about six months ago told this fabulous story on how they were able to understand reason for rep turnover. And with actually a decaying product, a decaying um, a, a turnover, a, a sales team that was experiencing a lot of turnover, they were able to isolate, hey, we know why these people are leaving the business. Even though the product is decaying, we know why they're leaving the business. We think we can make three tweaks. They were able to decrease sales turnover, which was before 100% a year, able to decrease it to 50% a year, which is still high, but I mean 50%. And again, with still a decaying product, they were able to increase sales in that business unit by 10% when in the past it was just decaying. Just because they're able to keep people in seats and to keep these sales processes moving along, right? That's just a great story to be able to tell. This 10% came because we were able to do these certain things. Maybe it wasn't completely 100% up to the HR people analytics team, but at least they played a contributing factor. There's so many great stories. Final slide, last quote, another great story. This would get us all excited to go out and do our jobs better. From McKinsey, now is a unique opportunity for HR professionals to position themselves as fact-based strategic partners of the executive board. Not the management team, not just to the C-suite on the executive board, because after all, we have insight into the most precious asset, which is the workforce. So as I said before, hopefully, hmm, you just have a little bit of that emoji. Hopefully there was something that I said that resonates with somebody. Um, and thank you for your attention. And guess what? I didn't see anybody falling asleep. And it's after lunch. That's the greatest compliment you could have given me. So thank you, everybody. If you have questions, I'll be happy to take them afterwards.